So we're uh, pleased to be talking to uh, Peter Labreau uh, this afternoon, um, talking about the, the great uh, Great Division uh, event that happened at uh, the Met, uh, which was then in Derby Hall in 1980. Um, I've been at the Met since 2001, um, and the story of that event has come back to us uh, year after year. So great to see someone who was there on the night. Um, I wonder, Peter, if you could start by uh, telling us what sort of venue the Derby Hall was in those days, and what, what was your role there, please? Well, Derby Hall was, um, I suppose, a traditional arts venue, um, so arts with a capital A. Um, it used to host small plays, um, string quartets, things like that. I don't remember it doing popularist things, and it certainly didn't do... Um, uh, any live performances of things like rock bands or things like that. Um, I didn't work at the Derby Hall, I was an art student um, and the the idea of gigs was started by one of the two people who ran the Derby Hall um, plus another art student, so Adrian Mealing ran the Derby Hall and uh, this the other art student who was in my class, um, Peter Godkin, um, came up with the idea and then they asked if uh, I'd like to get involved and this was very early on before it started back before it had a name um, and I remember meeting at the Hare and Hounds pub in Holcombe Brook to um, decide what the name could could be. Great and you uh, you ran a successful run of gigs with the Derby Hall then? Yeah it, we, at the time I think we were pushing against an open door Live live music was different then. If you went out to, say, between Hulkenbrook and Ramsbottom, there'd be a dozen pubs, and there would be a band on in a third of those many nights of the week. Uh, and it's quite hard to believe now, but live music was really quite common. But the problem with it was that nobody was really letting in bands who were trying something different they found it hard to find an audience or hard to find a venue. So that was the idea behind gigs, really, was to, to, to be able to provide a platform for those bands. That said, um, many of those more experimental bands didn't draw a big audience, so we also used to have either bigger names in or more standard rock bands, but we tried never to have cover bands in. So, you know, the income from those weeks would help pay for um, some of the other choices that we made. Uh, and we tried to be, you know, quite non-partisan in, in, in what we put on. And we put on bands from um, jazz to punk, poets, um, you know, rock, metal, um, prog, you know, virtually everything. Um, the club was run um, under the auspices of the Derby Hall, which was their way of not being kind of legally responsible for what we were doing, but having some governing control over what we couldn't do, but in a very loose way. And essentially part of the door taking, 70 or 80%, I can't remember, went directly to the band. Um, and then a small amount went to um, the, the Derby Hall. Um, but actually really it was the bar takings that, that kept the club going. And we ran it as a club so people could be members. And if they, members, if they were members, they got um, reduced price tickets. Um, and I would say probably somewhere between, depending on the night, somewhere between half of the audience and maybe, maybe a bit less would be non-members. So it gave us a, you know, a regular um, stream of people who were just interested in music, regardless of what the music was. Okay, and I, I guess at the moment today we, we had audiences, half of our audience come locally from Bury, but half travelled from sort of throughout Greater Manchester, depending on, on what the act is. is that, was that the case back then? It's very difficult to say. I, I would say probably more came from Bury. Um, um, certainly some did come from uh, further, uh, further afield, but it would depend on the act. Uh, um, so, no, definitely more than half came, came from Bury. Um, I, I mean, I would, if I was going to hazard a guess, I would probably say two thirds. Okay. So, uh, so Tuesday the 8th of April, 1980, uh, a factory uh, bill was proposed. How did that come about, Peter? 
That was driven by Adrian Meerling. Um, he was very keen to have a factory night. The music scene in Manchester was getting really big. At that time, most of the bands we put on approached us, and they were, you know, quite a lot of small bands would put cassettes through the door, and we would listen to them. So I, I think Factory was probably one of the very few times we approached artists and asked, and asked them um, if, if they play. Um, we didn't know whether Joy Division would be on the bill. Uh, we hoped they would be, uh, and it was vague for some time as to whether or not they would. Uh, I'm not sure when it was confirmed, but it must have been a couple of weeks before because we needed to get posters together. Sure, um, and we have that, that poster uh, off the gig along with other gigs. Who, who was responsible for that poster, Peter? Well, the posters were a, a kind of a joint effort, really. I, 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 when I look at the artwork, I can't remember whether it was myself or Peter Godkin who did the artwork. I mean, you know, it's 40 years ago. I kind of remember doing it, but it looks like Peter Godkin's style. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but the text that's on it was always Adrian because he had a really um, off-the-wall sense of humour. So he, he would put together some neat descriptions of, uh, of, of what the bands were doing. So, and, then, and, and then Adrian would print them off. They used to have a little duplicating machine in the office and Adrian would print them off and then a team of us would go and sort of walk around Berry with blue tack. Great, and that must have been great to have Joy Division hooked for and to come off and then and to get it on the poster. It must have been a, felt like a good moment for you. It did, yeah, it did. It was probably, I mean, we did have some big bands, you know, Landscape played there, Maddie Pryor played there, so the Chameleons played there. So we did have some, mm -hmm. some big names, but certainly Joy Division was probably the biggest. Great. And... Um, Famously, Ian wasn't able to make it for the gig. At, at what point were you aware um, that there might be a, a change to line up? Uh, we weren't made aware. Um, the, 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 the arrangements for the evening could best be described as shambolic. Um, we, I was in charge of the lighting desk, which mean, it meant that I really needed running order, which you, you would expect to be given by any band. I was given no running order. Um, and in fact, I was told to put the lights on steel blue and not even fade them in or out or not take them down between the bands being on or off. And uh, the way it was kind of pitched was that the bands would just come on and come off and, and it would be a kind of a progression. Um, I, I don't know whether that was to kind of slightly hide the fact that, the, that Ian was only going to do a few songs and they knew in advance. Uh, I, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, but it was something of a mess. In fact, I had people coming up to me with Joy Division T-shirts on saying, "Our Joy Division on stage? Um, to which I would just say, well, you tell me. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and, and obviously the audience got you know, fairly discontented by this. Okay. Uh, um, and, and there was no announcement between the bands. You know, so it was quite hard to work out what was going on. Okay, and we've heard um, we've heard tales of, of how the evening finished, how it went, how, how did it progress from from your perspective? Um, I, I would say that gigs was always a wonderfully friendly family place. You know, you knew everybody that was in there, or many of the people that were in there. People would come over and chat at the lighting desk, or you know, it, it wasn't like that at all. Very few of the regulars were in. Um, it was mostly people who'd come to see Joy Division. Um, the fire regulations for the Derby Hall are, from memory, fewer than 300 people. Um, so, you know, we, we, there was a, a, a need to keep the number of people down. Um, unfortunately, the fire escape at the back, people were letting in. Um, audience members and, and, and actually it wasn't just audience members, audience members letting in other people um, there were people from, from the bands or roadies and, and that was very frustrating because it was very hard for us to police that um, so it, I, I would imagine we were over capacity um, so with, with a group of people who, who aren't normally there um, and who certainly weren't getting what they expected Okay, and, and the and the evening's famously described as a riot. Is, is that an accurate description? Would you say? I, th I think a riot is a bit of a reach. Um, it was definitely more than a skirmish, and it was enough for me to um, I I put on the hall lights, the main lights, and then I hid under the lighting desk. 
So, I, you know, it, it, it was enough for, to, to be a fight that you wouldn't want to be involved in. Uh, you know, and certainly, um, you know, glasses, um, beer glasses were flying. One was thrown up at one of the chandeliers that was there at the time. Um, and somebody was hitting someone with a microphone stand. So, you know, it, 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 it wasn't polite. Um, but a riot to me implies that everybody in the room was at it and it was a small group of people and quite a lot of people just wanted to get out of the way. Okay. As a, as a promoter and game organiser, to me it's always sounded like a, not a great night, not one of the finest moments. Um, how, how was the fallout from the event? How was, how was the next day or the next week in terms of your relationship with the venue? It, it, was, um, it was tense. Um, the, the venue... Um, it would be wrong to say they had us under sufferance, but that would be an exaggeration. That, you know, they certainly liked the fact that the bar takings were so good on the, on the gigs nights. Um, but what we did wasn't really what happened for the rest um, for the rest of the month. And this, I suppose, was some fears coming home to roost. Um, and um, I don't think there was any talk of stopping the club. Um, but it probably came close to that, um, you know, in terms of how well it was policed and managed and whose fault this was and, you know, this, that and the other. And there was, you know, some post-mortem in the office afterwards where myself and Adrian and Tony Wilson were there. And, you know, and Adrian was quite worried. Tony Wilson basically said, oh, it's just kids letting off steam. So, you know, two two opposing viewpoints. Um, and, but... You know, it, it all settled down and then, you know, the club carried on, um, you know, and, and only really in in the years since has it become the kind of the legend that it is. You know, it didn't really have the, that much notoriety at the time. Great. And, and what about for you? Did it end or was it close to the finish of your involvement with live music or has that continued with you? No, I, I, it hasn't continued with me. I, I, I um, all the way through art college, which was um, four years, and I would say I, I probably worked at the club for three years. I, I worked there um, every week, and um, like many of the people, I had multiple roles. So I, you know, I would um, be one of the people who worked on the door. I would operate lights, and I would work behind the bar. Um, sometimes all on the same night. Um, interestingly enough, so we didn't have a massive staff. Um, but when I got married, I moved to Oldham. Um, I, I just it was it was impossible for me to carry on. So I, I used to turn up now and again as a as a as a an audience member. And dare uh, I ask, have, have you been to the Met in recent years at all? Yeah, I, I have. Um, I should just say that my brother Andy he, he took over from me from gigs, and gigs carried on running for a lot longer. Um, and, and it changed. People used to, I used to walk through Berry and people would go, ah, Pete LeBrow from the other side of the street, because, just because of gigs. And then uh, a couple of years after that, I'd, I'd walk through Berry and people would say, oh, Andy LeBrow's brother. <laughs> so, so, it, so it changed. Sorry, your question was again. I, well, I was going to say, had you been to the Met in recent years? I, I have. I've been, um, not, not a lot of times, I've been a couple of times. I came to see um, Claire Mooney, who's a Manchester singer-songwriter, and a very, very good friend of mine. In fact, I did, I did a video for her. Um, so I've been a couple of times, but I've been tempted to come in just and have a look around and see what the office is like. And I did exchange some comments on Facebook with some of your team because um, they'd been talking about the events and obviously I'd seen that the poster still existed, which amazed me. Yes, it does. And in fact, I was speaking to your brother Andy a couple of months ago Mm. And his first reaction was, uh, you think I'm Peter, but I'm not. So obviously that, that confusion still exists around Barry between the brothers. Yeah, we're often mistaken for each other. Less so now because he's retained his hair and I haven't. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for joining us, Peter. It's, it's fascinating to hear the, the detail of the evening. And, and I say it, it's, a, it's a part of the Mets history um, and has informed uh, lots of people's view of the venue. But... Uh, something that we're very fond of and a story that gets told again and again. So, so thank you for your contribution and really good to chat to you this afternoon. That's great. Thank you very much. See you.